contest of Genesis 3.15 in the book of Judges. And for the sake of those who might not have been with us, just want to just go back briefly and review what we considered in part last evening. We considered basically our relationship to Jabin, king of Canaan. And we saw, of course, that he represented king sin. To be very specific, in the scripture, Jabin equals the serpent. So when you are reading your Bible and you come across the Jabin of Joshua 11 and the Jabin of Judges chapter 4, read Jabin, pink serpent. That's the simple equation. And we saw his place in the scheme of things. And here we've got, of course, the participants in this wonderful drama of Judges chapter 4 and 5. We're going to have a look at each of these, and in particular in this session this afternoon, young people, we're going to be looking at Deborah and Barak, God's representatives in this parable of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, played out as it is here in the book of Judges. Just a brief look at uh, some of these themes. Uh, in, the, in the way of detail, we saw Jacob's name means intelligent or wise, and that matches the serpent of Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. We saw that this dynastic name uh, is of the kings who ruled from Hatsor, and we'll say a bit more about Hatsor in a subsequent uh, session today, God willing. We see Joshua 11 and Judges 4, as I said, is all about this, this king of sin, the servant of power. The king of Canaan is called. Canaan meaning humiliated. And that's exactly what the servant nature that you and I have does to each one of us. And it starts pretty young in life, doesn't it? It humiliates you by sin. Later in life, it humiliates you by physical weakness. At some point in life, you're going to be humiliated by disease, as some of our number tragically are being right now. So this is the nature that we want changed. We want to be rid of the serpent, young people. We want to have this nature changed in the likeness of Almighty God and His Son. And that's about to happen because Christ is about to come. And there will be, doubtless, many of us in this hall who will receive that change if we remain faithful to the end. We just had a brief look last evening at Sisera, the seed of the servant. We pointed out that Jacob basically just stays at Hatzor. And he lets Sisera and his men do his dirty work. His name, Sisera, means warlike array or a field of battle. He lives in a place called Harasheth of the Gentiles, which means mechanical work. And as Jacob's captain, he's going to represent the serpent in violent political manifestation to make Israel's life unbearable. He pointed out that the iron chariots, or the iron-tipped chariots, they weren't all of iron, of course. Horses would have great difficulty in pulling a chariot all of iron. So these are iron-tipped chariots. And the iron points, of course, in the type to Rome and the work of the Romans and the crucifixion of Christ. And they spread out brought right across the breadbasket of Israel, plundering. And you notice in Judges chapter 5, you come to Judges 5 and read from, say, verse 28. Sisera was late. In fact, he was dead at the hands of Jael, as we're going to see in our session later on. And Sisera's mother, it says in verse 28, looked out of the window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? And her wise ladies calmed her and they said, Yay, you know, have they not sped, verse 30? Have they not divided the prey to every man, a damsel or two? Now, do I need to spell out what that means to the young ladies of Israel? When these Canaanites spread out all through these cities around the valley of Jezreel, they went out for a number of reasons. And one of them was to bring home stuff, clothing and all sorts of stuff. And that's what Sisera's mother was waiting for. She wanted all of these new gowns and garments that had been ripped off people's bodies and taken out of their wardrobes. But the men went out for a different reason. The men went out to find young girls, the virgins of Israel, to corrupt them and then probably to kill them when they were done with them. So when you look at what Sisera was about, the agent of Jabin, you see the world in which we live today, don't you? There are many Canaanites out there, young people, and I'll tell you something, I happen to be a male, a Christadelphian male, thankfully. 
And I understand a bit about human nature. I'll tell you something, and there's plenty of our young girls who I know don't fully understand this. The men, the young men out there are interested in you for one, and I mean one reason. It is to defy you. And there are some of our young girls who found that out to their cost. So take the warning. We're dealing with Jabin and Sisera. And they don't mess around. When they come for young women, they have to corrupt and defile them and then kill them. And that's what was happening in Israel. And that's why God needed to demonstrate to his people that he was going to intervene and destroy this power of the serpent in due time. He's going to give them a picture of what he's about to do in the earth right very soon. Right in our days, young people. He's going to send his son and the events of Judges 4 and 5 are going to play themselves out again in the events of Armageddon. He's going to deal with this world and he's going to bind the serpent power so they can't corrupt his people anymore. That's what he's going to do. So this is a very important study for young people. Here we've got the, the machinations of men like Sisera and those who went with him. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey? To every man a damsel or two, not satisfied with one, two. To Sisera, a prey of divers colours, a prey of divers colours of needlework, of divers colours of needlework on both sides. It's poetic language, isn't it? But it's just, it just keeps repeating itself because it's saying that this is what they did for years. And they made Israel's life unbearable. Young people, let's see if we can extract the lessons today from this study for ourselves. I'm going to talk about a few principles here in this first session that we need to understand. For we've seen Sisera, we know who he represents. Now all of this, of course, is a cameo, as we've said many times, of Genesis 3.15. So here are the players. Jacob, type of the serpent, of the carnal mind in all its corruption. Sisera, a type of the seed of the serpent, who does the serpent's bidding. We're going to find that Deborah represents the divine mind in Israel because they came up to her for judgment, it says. If you have a look at Judges chapter 4 and verse 5, she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. I want to talk a bit about that in a moment because there are people in our community I'll be right up front with you. There are people in our community and they're publishing books and sending those books to ecclesias right around the world saying that this, amongst other things, this passage here in Judges 4 and 5 is evidence that Christadelphia has had it all wrong. For 170 years we've had it all wrong. That the role of sisters that we have practiced is not biblical. That we should take the example of Deborah. She was a judge in Israel and they came up to her to receive counsel and instruction. So why shouldn't we have sisters on the platform today? That's one of their arguments. You see, they have no idea what Judges 4 and 5 is about. Most of what I've read in that book is based on ignorance, not biblical exegesis. So I'm going to talk about that uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to lay it out. You can expect that from me, can't you? I'm going to lay it out and give it to you scripturally and demonstrate why Deborah is a judge in Israel at this time of, the, of its history. And when you understand what God was doing here, then it just cancels out all the other nonsense that's being spoken about these two chapters in our Bible. Barak is the type of Christ in this wonderful drama. The seed of the woman, as we're going to see. And there are 10,000 men who represent Christ's disciples who follow him. See in verse 10 of Judges 4, Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali, the Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. The RSV says, at his heels. So they're all following in his footsteps. You know what Christ said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 24? If any man will not take up his cross and follow after me, he is not worthy of me. And the word in the Greek means to follow in his stead. So he expects us to take up our cross and to follow exactly in his steps, in the way of the cross. This is what these men were doing. They followed Barak, the type of Christ 
to Mount Tabor, which means fragile. It placed them in a very fragile position. But of course, we know the end of this drama. There was a divine intervention and the overthrow of Sisera and his host, and then finally, of course, ultimately of Jacob. Heber is the type of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. Have a look at verse 11 of Judges 4. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had set himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. So it's up in the north. Kadesh is where, of course, Barak is from. So here we have Heber the Kenite. Now, where would the where were the Kenites normally in Israel? Where did they have their inheritance? Do you know? Well, they were in the south of Judah. And this man had come the full length of the land from the south of Judah right up to Kadesh, which is even further north than Hatzor. And he's made an alliance with Jabin, king of Canaan. And it's the house of Heber, in verse 12, that shows Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. The Lord Jesus Christ had 12 disciples. There was only one of them from Judah. All the rest were from Galilee. You know who it was that came from Judah? Well, Judah of Kerioth. In the Greek and in the English, Judas Iscariot. So here was a man who came from the south of Judah who goes to the leader of the opposition and tells them that Barak and the men of Israel have gone up to a place that makes them very fragile table. That's exactly what Judas Iscariot did, young people. When Jesus Christ started to talk about dying, you know what Judas Iscariot did? He went to the high priest and said, strike now. Now's the time. He's talking about dying. He's at his point of greatest witness. Get him now and give me the 30 pieces of silver. That's what he did. Here's the man, the only disciple from Judah in the company of Christ. And here he's matched. Here he's typed by Heber the Kenite. So here we have a marvellous story unfolding. And we're going to find that Jael in one of our subsequent sessions. Jael is the representative of the divine mind manifested in Christ. We're going to see that the woman, young people, the woman is the divine element in the atonement. And this is the reason why we have two women in this story. Why we've got Deborah and why we've got Jael. It's got nothing, absolutely nothing, I mean zero, to do with the position of women in the Ecclesia. It's got everything to do with God revealing in this wonderful story His mind in overthrowing the power of sin. We will see that as we proceed here this afternoon. Now what was the problem? Why did Deborah have to emerge as a judge in Israel? Why weren't there brethren? Well, there were brethren. One of them, of course, the principal one, was Barak. But he was way up north, north of Hatzor, not able to freely move through the land. His movements from Kadesh to Tabor were noted by Heber. So he was always under pressure. Deborah was in the middle of the land. So there were men like Barak, but they had their hands tied to a large degree. And the time was not right for him to emerge. So what was the reason why God raised up Deborah? Well, we have the answer to that in Judges chapter 5. We read in Judges 5 these words, the song of Deborah in verse 1. <laughs> the song of Deborah and Barak, you will notice in verse 1. Praising Yahweh for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Now this word avenging is a Hebrew word, para paraf. It literally means long-haired leaders, women. Praise ye Yahweh for the long-haired leaders of Israel. This is going to celebrate two women, Deborah and Jael. In fact, Jael, of her it is said, Blessed art thou among women, Jael. I think I recall other words that say something like that about the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we'll come to that in due time. In verse 7 of Judges 5, we read this. We've just been told in verses 5, sorry, verse 6, that the highways were vacated. 
In the days of Shengar, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. The travellers found their way around through mountain trails because, of course, the Canaanites, the men of Jabin and Sisera, occupied the plains. So they had to creep around the land and try and stay away from the enemy. We read in verse 7, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until the I, Deborah, arose. But I arose, a mother in Israel. Now this word villages here is the Hebrew word parazam. It means magistrate, magistracy or leadership. So that Rotherham translates it, there was a failure of rulers in Israel. So the rulers had failed. The men had failed. And so God uses the opportunity. He sees this time, a time in history, when he can seize the opportunity to set forth a marvellous parable about Genesis 3.15, about the way that he would overthrow the power of the serpent through his son. We read in verse 9 these words. My heart is toward the governors of Israel. And that word governors there, chazak, means to hack or to engrave. It is elsewhere translated as lawgiver in places like Genesis 49 and verse 10. So this is about Bible students. Deborah says, My heart is towards the Bible students of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye Yahweh. And then we read in verse 10 these words. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. Now this word speak means to ponder, that is to converse with oneself, hence to meditate. And the priests and the nobles of Israel had failed. You see, when you read about people riding upon white asses, that was the transport of royalty. Kings rode on white asses. So here were the people who should have been in the forefront, who should have been the leaders, who should have been the teachers, and they had failed their brethren. And so God had to raise up a woman, a mother in Israel, who would occupy that position of judge for a time. We read in verse 11 of Judges 5. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of Yahweh, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of Yahweh go down to the gates. Now again, there's some pretty troubled translations there. This word archers of verse 11, chatsats, means to chop into pieces, to distribute, hence to divide. And literally, it could be rendered as we have here. The noise of those who divided the spoil was heard in the places of drawing water. Now this was the problem. Why did you go to the well in Israel? Well, to get water. It was the only place you could get it. What does that water represent? The word of God. But you couldn't go there because the men of Sisera, the army of Sisera, who had just gone out and taken spoil, would come to the well. And so they had displaced the Israelites. And there they divided the spoils of their conflicts with the villages of Israel. This was a terrible time in their history. The place of the archers or the place of those who divided the spoil. But now, of course, in the wake of the victory, this song can be written. And they will come to this place to rehearse. The word means to attribute honour, to commemorate. There are two occurrences of that in Judges 11 and verse 40 about, of course, the daughter of Jephthah, a wonderful woman. So here they're going to come and they're going to rehearse the righteous acts of Yahweh. Now the word villages, towards the end of verse 11, his villages in Israel is again this word parazam that we met in verse 7. It means leaders. It refers here to Deborah, to Barak, and to Jael. So this was a time to commemorate the leaders of Israel who had delivered God's people from the hand of the spoiler. When will they do this? Well, they're going to come to the gates. And the gate, of course, is the place of administration, rulership, and judgment. So here we have Deborah's song. And then we read this in verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak. You know, this is a wonderful way of presenting the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Arise, 
Barak is the language of resurrection. We're going to see that the battle that takes place in Jael's 10 that leads to the destruction of Sisera is a wonderful type of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the work of his crucifixion from which he was raised from the dead by God. And so when we read that word arise, it leads us in that direction. Now, what about this woman, Deborah? Let's go back to verse 4 of Judges 4. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife, wife of Lapidoff, she judged Israel at that time. And so here we have this woman. Now her name means a bee. From the root, orderly motion. Anybody, of course, a springtime here, almost springtime. What you're going to see in the next couple of weeks are the bees coming out because they'll be new, probably, I don't know. There'll be bugs and flowers starting to blossom. And so the bees will come out and they will be going around. you watch bees, haven't you? You've seen them? Orderly motion. They know exactly where they are. They can go back to the hive. They don't get lost. There's an instinctive wisdom in them. Who put that wisdom in them? God. You see? And that's why this woman, Deborah, is chosen. That's why her name is significant. Because she is going to be the symbol for divine wisdom in action. The mind of God revealed in Israel at this time. A time of the failure of the leaders of God's people who should have been administering justice and judgment and distributing the divine thinking amongst his people. It wasn't happening. So God raises up this woman. All the emotion. Now she's the wife of Lapidoth, which means to shine as lightning. Now this, of course, is speaking about a divine light that nobody can miss. Where I come from, we get a storm almost every afternoon or evening in the summertime. And I'll tell you something, you never miss it. You can see it coming. Across the, 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 the horizon, you can see the lightning flashing away. And as the Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 17, verse 24, he said, don't worry about my coming. He says, when I come, it'll be obvious to all. Like a lightning that lightens up the heaven. And when Armageddon, of course, occurs, it will be obvious to all that our Lord Jesus Christ is in the earth. So here we've got Lapidoth to shine as lightning. And so, of course, Deborah is the one through whom that light would shine to Israel. She's the wife of Lapidoth, which I think strongly suggests that, that was a, ter a terrific marriage. So here we've got Deborah. Where's she living? Well, by the palm tree, we read in verse 5. She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Rabah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. Now, I think most of us are pretty familiar with palm trees. Well, maybe not in this country. We are in ours. Palm trees, they grow straight up. The word actually has the idea of to be erect or upright. You know, men have tried to weigh down a palm tree. They tie a rope on a palm tree and they put a weight over here and they try and tie it down. And the palm tree insists on going straight up. And so in Psalm 92 and verse 12, God uses the palm tree as a symbol for a righteous man. Palm trees are evergreen. They're noted for their striking beauty and their uprightness. Their fruit is in their head. They go straight towards the sun. Got the idea? The palm tree is a symbol for righteous people. Going straight up towards the light. Evergreen. Fruit in the head. That is where Deborah resided. And that's where she administered judgment in Israel. Now it's between Ramah, which means a height, and of course we know that Christadelphians who are baptised sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And Bethel, which means the house of God, the ecclesia. So you see, when you start looking at these names, you begin to see the picture. Here we have the divine representative in Israel that's going to oppose the serpent, Jacob. This woman represents the divine mind in the scheme of the atonement. What about Barak? Well, Barak is the type of Christ in Judges 4 and 5. His name signifies a glittering or a flashing sword. 
from the sun shining on a moving blade. And we know from Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is quick. It's alive. It is sharper than any two-edged sword that it divides between that which is soulish, that is fleshly, and that which is spiritual. And it carves down the middle and it puts flesh on that side and spirit on that side. That's the Word of God. But it's got to be seen in action. If I had a sword and I went out in that bright sun this afternoon and I stood there like this, you reckon you'd see it flashing or glittering? No. You only get flashing and glittering when you're doing this. And you're happy. Flash. Got an idea? Is that vivid enough? You see what the point is? The Word of God only cuts between flesh and spirit when it's active. You leave the Bible on the shelf and nothing will happen in your life. Nothing. Unless that book is active in your brain, then there won't be any separation between flesh and spirit in your life. And who was the one who's described as the Word made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. So Barak's name means a glittering or a flashing sword. Here we've got a wonderful way of presenting the Son of God, the Word made flesh in action. Now we read of him that he was the father, that his father's name was Abinoam. You come down to verse 6 of Judges chapter 4. And Deborah sent and called Barak the son of Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali. Now Abinoam means the father of graciousness. Do I need to say any more? He's revealed this man, Barak, as a type of Christ. Now let's prove that beyond all dispute, shall we? Let's lay this one to rest. Have a look at Judges chapter 5 and verse 12. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive. Now, son of the father of graciousness. Now, that's quoted in Psalm 68 and verse 18. Come along to Psalm 68. I want to show you a couple of passages out of this psalm. And those of you who have done a little bit of work on the events subsequent to the return of Christ will know that Psalm 68 is all about the march of the rainbow angel. The work that begins, at least, begins in earnest at Armageddon and goes on for 40 years thereafter. That's what Psalm 68 is about. And David wrote this psalm when he brought the ark to Zion. Now the ark had been constructed at Sinai, which is where the saints are going to be made into the divine vehicle of judgment. They'll be made into the ark of the covenant at Sinai, just where Israel built the ark and the tabernacle, etc. That's where we're going to receive immortality, young people, if we're found fit and worthy. And from there we will proceed on a march. And that march is going to culminate in Zion. That's why it says in Psalm 68 verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of change ones. Yahweh is among them, and this is how it should read, from Sinai into the holy place, into the sanctuary. Now look at verse 18. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Where are those words coming from? Well, they're from Judges chapter 5, verse 12, aren't they? It's actually a quotation from Judges 5, 12. Read on in verse 18. Thou hast received gifts for me, yea, for the rebellious also, that Yahweh Elohim might dwell among them. Then look at verse 21. That God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on spew in his trespasses. What do you reckon that's a reference to? God shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp. I tell you there was a hairy scalp in Israel that needed to be bludgeoned with a hammer and fixed to the ground with a tent peg. It was the hairy scalp of Sisera. So you see the language of Psalm 68 is being borrowed from Judges 4 and 5. Why? Well, because Psalm 68 is about Armageddon. 
and the establishment of the kingdom. That's its secondary meaning. When you consider Judges 4 and 5, its secondary meaning is the work of Christ and the saints in binding the old serpent, begins at Armageddon. It ends 40 years later with the serpent bound for a thousand years. That's why the language is drawn from Judges 4 and 5. But this is not the last time you read those words. Thou shalt lead captivity captive. Come along to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we read in verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Look at your margin, it's coming from Psalm 68 and verse 18. So the Apostle Paul quotes this about the resurrection of Christ. And his ascension to the right hand of the Father and the giving of the Spirit gifts to his disciples to promote the work of building the ecclesia. Thou hast led captivity captive. So when we read in Judges chapter 5, verse 12, Arise, Barak, it's about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Got it? So this. This is the Bible explaining itself to us young people, which is the way it ought to be. Let the Bible do the explaining. It's quite capable of it, I can tell you. Much better than you or I. It's quite capable of explaining itself. And it does it here in Judges chapter 5. So let's go back to the fifth chapter of Judges and carry on. We can see very, very plainly now, by the way the scripture uses the language of Judges 5 verse 12, that Barak is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now where is he? Well he's in Kadesh Naphtali. So we read, we read over in chapter 4 and in verse 6 that he's in Kadesh Naphtali. Where's that? Well firstly the name Kadesh Naphtali means the sanctuary of my wrestling. Now this is when he's called by Deborah to come down and to expose himself on this fragile place, Mount Tabor, the cone-shaped mountain that sticks up out of the valley of Jezreel. It's the last place on earth that you would take an army that doesn't have any armaments, no weapons. And we're told that. We're told that in Judges chapter 5, that there was not a sword or a spear amongst the 10,000 men that came to Mount Tabor. They are, they're without arms. They've got nothing to fight with. This is the last place you would go. Unless, of course, you're being set forth as a type of Christ. Because the last place that he should have gone is to Jerusalem. And he set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that it would lead to his crucifixion. Here we've got the time. Where did he come from? Well, he came from Nazareth, didn't he? That's where he began his ministry, and from Galilee. Where's this place? Kadesh Naphtali. Well, it's 32 kilometers from Nazareth. So here we've got the type of our Lord Jesus Christ. 30 years he was, young people. 30 years in Nazareth. What for? It was the sanctuary of his wrestling. And every single day of that 30 years, as it were, once of course he was old enough, there was a struggle going on in this man. It was a wrestling against the flesh. There was a division in his life between flesh and spirit. And there every day, as he went to the carpenter's workshop, he had to contend against the thoughts of the mind. You know something about that, don't you? You know something about the Jabin thoughts of the mind? You know, the ones that come up in your mind? He had that problem too. And he had to wrestle with that. Day after day after day. It was the sanctuary of his wrestling until he burst forth upon the scene for a three and a half year ministry. 
which culminates in his crucifixion, which is the story of the end of Judges chapter 4. So we can see why these things are there, recorded for us. And what do we read about Balak? Well, in Judges chapter 5, verse 13, we read this. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. Yahweh made me have dominion over the mighty. Now the interlinear Bible translate that, translates that verse this way. Then tread upon the remnant of the noble ones of the people. Yahweh trod for me among the warriors. That puts a bit of a different spine on it, doesn't it? This refers to Barak as a time of Christ in his victory over the nations at Armageddon. He's going to tread down the enemies of God. Cited in Psalm 68, of course, verse 12, so we know that the subject is Armageddon. That's its ultimate and secondary meaning. Psalm 68, 21, we've seen the reference to Sisera, the, the hairy scalp of such a one who goes on still in his trespasses. It's a reference to Sisera's death, which is the story at the end of Judges chapter 4. And having dominion, of course, this is the word radar, which is first used in our Bibles in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, when God said to Adam and to Eve, let them have dominion. Dominion over carnal things. Well, of course, it wasn't all that long. And Adam and Eve had lost that dominion through sin. Who would restore that? Who has restored dominion, at least in himself? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. And who's coming to restore in the earth? The Lord Jesus Christ. But this reference here to Barak is a type of the work that awaits still our Lord when he comes from the right hand of the Father to complete the work of subduing the power of the serpent in the earth. But what about the response of Israel to all of this? Let me just ask you a question, young people. Some of you are wise enough and old enough to understand where I'm coming from. What's the most important subject in the truth? Thought about that? Some of you will say, well, God manifestation, true, most important doctrine of the Bible. But how do you get God manifestation? How will you become manifestations of God on the earth? Well, only through the atoning work of Christ. So at the end of the day, when you distill it down, the most important doctrine is the atonement. And you know, since our community was formed in the late 1840s, there have been continuing debates about the atonement. And they're ongoing to this very day. I'll tell you something. I'll keep on going until Christ comes. It's probably the most difficult subject to understand in its finer details. It's simple in its general concepts, but difficult because it's being made difficult by human thinking and human phraseology being imposed upon biblical language. I know a bit about this. I've spent the last 40 years debating the subject in Australia against two opposite extremes. So I know a bit about it. It afflicts this continent. No question about that. It's the most important thing on the plate of every Christadelphian who lives on this continent right now. And I mean that. It's the most important thing. It's at the heart of our problems, both individually and ecclesially. So I ask the question, what's your response to this most important issue? Well, have a look at Israel's response. This section of scripture is about the atonement. It's about Genesis 3.15 being played out. What was the response of the tribes of Israel to this issue in their day? You'll see that it's a mirror. It's a mirror of our days. Don't question about that. Human nature hasn't changed. And the way people behave in history is the way they behave in the present. That's just the way we are. Unless, of course, we've learnt the, the lessons of history. And there are good examples here and there are bad examples. Let's have a look at them. Let's have a look at verse 14 of Judges chapter 5. This is the response of the tribes to these issues that confront the nation. Revolving around the atonement, the work of Christ, the redemption of mankind on the basis of Genesis 3.15. Out of Ephraim, it says, was there a root of them 
against Amalek. Wonder why Amalek gets a mention here. How come? What's Amalek got to do with this? Well, I'll tell you something. Amalek, in the Bible, represents the serpent in political manifestation. You want proof of that? Go to Exodus chapter 17. When the water came out of a smitten rock, the rock that was smitten by a serpent rock, that's the crucifixion of Christ. When water came out, guess who's the first on the scene to steal that water from Israel? Amalek. Why? Well, because in the divine scheme, Amalek represents the serpent in political manifestation. That's why. And at the end of Exodus chapter 17, in verse 16, you read these words. When Moses has made an altar called Yahweh Nisai, which, by the way, is about the rod, okay, the rod that was used to smite the rock, which represents the cross of Christ, and we know this is true, because that's the first time the word Ness, N-E-C, is used in the Bible. And the next time is Numbers chapter 21 verse 9. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Yes, the rod upon which Aaron put the brazen serpent is a Ness. So we know what that's about. It's about the cross of Christ. So the altar, Yahweh Nessai, was built and then Yahweh said this. Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That's Genesis 3.15. Yahweh will have war. Well, I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. Got it? So when God chooses a nation to represent the serpent in political manifestation, he chooses Amalek. And that's why Gog and Magog are in Revelation chapter 20. Gog and Magog are the ones to whom the serpent goes that they, that they might rebel against Christ and the saints. Gog and Magog? Yes, but not the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're long since gone. They've faded into history. But not the serpent in political manifestation. Gog and Magog? You know, Gog is otherwise rendered in the Bible, Agag. Check Numbers 24, verse 7. His king shall be greater than Agag, might be verse 8. His king, Israel's king, shall be greater than Agag. Have a look at the Septuagint. It says Gog. Gog and Agag are one and the same thing. And that's why Gog and Magog are in Revelation 20. What's Revelation 20 about? The suit in political manifestation. That's why they're there. So when you read Amalek here in Judges chapter 5 verse 14, read servant in political manifestation. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. So they came up, the men of Ephraim, they came up to Mount Tabor to join the forces of Barak. What about Benjamin? Well, it goes on to say this. And among, after thee it says, Benjamin among thy people. So Benjamin comes up. Who after him? Well, out of Makur came down governors. Governors? Yeah, the same word as verse 9. Lawgivers, Bible students came from Manasseh. Makur being, of course, one of the famous names of the tribe of Manasseh. What about Zebulun? Well, we read at the end of verse 14, and out of Zebulun they that handle the pen of the writer. These are scrolls. These are people who are writing out the copy of the law of God. They're Bible students. Yes, I'll tell you something. When it comes to the issues of the atonement, when there are problems in our, in our community, guess who you can rely upon? Real Bible students. That's who you can rely upon. Real Bible students. So young people, let us learn some lessons from that. What about Issachar? Well, they're there too. We read in verse 15, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. But then comes the rest. What about Reuben? Well, we read this. At the end of verse 15, for the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart 
Now that word there, great thoughts, in the Hebrew means a resolution. And Rotherham translates it, great were the resolves of heart amongst Reuben. Now Reuben's down here. He's a long way from this conflict. And he says, you know, we really should help our brethren. We should stand firmly behind our brethren in the north. But then something changed. Read on, verse 16. Why abodest thou among the, the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? And the word bleatings here means a whistling in the sense of mocking. Rotherham translates it to hear the mockings of the sheepfolds. You know what sheep are like? <coughs> Bang! <laughs> Sounds a little bit like ha! <laughs> Isn't it? So the sheep are laughing at Reuben. Why? What it says here? For the divisions of Reuben were their great searchings of heart. Searchings? Yes. The Hebrew word means an examination, a deliberation, and Rotherham translates it great counsellings and debate. Debate amongst Reuben killed their resolve to help. And they didn't come. They didn't come to sort out the issues of the atonement on Mount Tabor. They stayed home. Initially, great resolve. And they thought, oh, brethren, no, we've got to, well, we're a long way from this struggle, and, you know, I think it'd be better if we just stayed home. Got a picture? History tends to repeat itself. Watch out. Reuben, see the change of the colour? Blue for the tribes that respond. Flesh colour for the tribes who don't. Who comes next? Gilead. Verse 17. Gilead abode among uh, beyond Jordan. See, Gilead's over here. Oh, they're safely ensconced across the Jordan. Very conveniently. Uh, well, we did hear a few things going on over there, but you know, that's their problem, not ours. Let's go fishing. What about Dan? Well, we read about Dan in verse 17. And why did Dan remain in ships? Dan? Well, if, if it's a reference to Dan up here in the north, he's a long way from the ocean. But it's time for a holiday. You're going to get in a boat and push offshore. You can keep away from trouble that way, can't you? That's miles from trouble. What about Asher? Well, we read this. In verse 17, Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his bridges. Now Asher lived by the seashore. When he heard about Barak going a bit, oh, let's get out of here. This is time for Florida. Let's go. And they were off. Rowing as fast as they could go. And what about Naphtali? Well, we read, sorry, just read the end of verse uh, 17. Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his bridges. Now this word here uh, for breaches is a word that means creeks, breaks in the, in the shoreline, creeks. So they're hiding in the creeks. That's what they were doing. Then we read in verse 18, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives under the death in the high places of the field. So there was the response of the tribes to the issues that were confronted here in Judges 4 and five. And there was a, a worse place. You have to look down at verse 23. Curse ye Meros, said the angel of Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh? Yeah, this is not this is not Barak. This is not some other man of Israel saying this. This is the angel that Yahweh sent to destroy the host of Sisyrus. Curse ye that city of Meros. Look at them sitting there in their own chairs. Not taking any part in this at all. Look at them! Curse ye Meros, said the angel. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of Yahweh, to the help of Yahweh against the mighty. What a repudiation by God that is. Let's hope that the judgment seat we don't get anything like that. What were these people? Meros means refuge, root, to draw in, to betake oneself. So the name of the town encapsulates the policy of its inhabitants. Let's just not do anything. That was their policy. So what does God do? Well, he gets involved. He gets involved. That's what he does. There's a quick summary of what happens here in chapters 4 and 5. We read in chapter 4 that Deborah sends for Barak. 
From down here, she sends up to Kadesh Naphtali the sanctuary is wrestling. He calls the men of Zebulun and Naphtali, and they come to him in their thousands. He then leads them to Mount Tabor, the fragile mountain, exposing himself to mortal danger. Sisera, meanwhile, having received this report from the camp of Heber, the traitor, Judas Iscariot, marshals his forces around the river Kishon, which means winding. Winding? Yeah, like a serpent. And he gets his forces, and he marches them on both sides of the Kishon. And you look down from Mount Tabor, you saw this great army winding around. It's a snake. It's a serpent. It's the serpent in political manifestation. And a violent storm sweeps across Jezreel. How do we know that? Well, have a look at Judges chapter 5 and at verse 20 and 21. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. How did they fight? Well, just pop over to Judges chapter 5 and verse 4. Read this. This is a recounting of the history of God bringing Israel out of Egypt. It says this. Yahweh, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, and the clouds also dropped water. So there's your hand. This was a violent storm that built up in the east, and it came from behind them. Here is Barak and his 10,000 men on Tabor, and they're looking down upon the forces of Sisera, and they see this huge storm building up from behind them. So let's go back there and look at it again. Here it comes. This storm that sweeps across the valley of Jezreel and it drops massive quantities of rain upon the valley. Where's it going to go? Well, where's the lowest depression? No, oh, the river Kishon. And that's where Sisera's forces are assembled. Chaos, absolute chaos. Have a look at verse 21. The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh, my soul, I was trodden downstream. Then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the branchings, the branchings of their mighty ones. So the thunder and the lightning and the heavy rain and the horses, they were out of control. And, boom, and all, of course, they're tangled up in all. The chariots are useless. They bog down in the mud. Down comes Barak and his 10,000 men. They pick up the weapons of the Canaanites and start hacking them to pieces. That's the drum of Judges 4 and 5. Young people, Cicero alone, escapes on foot to Jael's camp. And this is our final word in this session. Judges 5.31. This is what's going to happen in that tent that guarantees this verse. Verse 31, chapter 5. So let all our enemies perish, O Yahweh, but let them that love him he is the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest 40 years, means millennial rest. Brother he translates that verse, So perish all thy enemies, O Yahweh, but be they who love him as the going forth of the sun in his might. Enemies, that word is first used in our Bibles in Genesis 22, verse 17. He shall possess the gate of his enemies. It is cognate with the word that is used in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. We need to be amongst those who love Yahweh. The word is first used in Genesis 22 verse 2. Take thy son whom thou lovest. Got it? And the son will be brilliant. The son of righteousness that will soon arise in the earth. He's going forth as the son. Brothers and sisters and young people, we want to be part of that country.